days away from the Detroit primary and one step closer to the next generation of city leaders. Plus, can the Medicaid deal get done in Lansing? And popularity contest, is the governor winning since Detroit filed Chapter 9? My week starts right now. Michigan's turnaround is being powered by things we do better than anywhere else in the world. Today's global leaders routinely turn to Michigan to work on their most difficult problems. That's because the engineering talent in this part of the world is simply the best. So many possibilities lie ahead for Michigan's future. These opportunities are here and starting to happen. The vision for the new Michigan. Share it, talk it up, drive it home. Funding is also provided by Delta. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us for my week. I'm Christy McDonald. It's primary election time in Detroit and there has been no shortage of bizarre surprises and twists this season. And though the city has filed for bankruptcy, an emergency manager is in charge. That doesn't mean that these positions are powerless. This is arguably one of the most important elections for the future of Detroit. Let's get started tonight here in our Midtown studios with our My Week contributors and the editorial page editors of the Detroit News and Detroit Free Press, Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. Good to be here. All right, so we're a couple days before the Five primary. Days. Finally, Six we days. have finally arrived at this uh, at this point. So um, where are we in the mayoral uh, election? You guys both moderated a large candidate forum. We're trying to forget that. <laughs> All 13 of them on the stage, which I, which I think is very ambitious anyway, to have that many people to try to get, uh, you know, statements out of them that people, that voters can really I don't know, hang on to and, and use in their decision making process. But where are we in this race? Does it still come down to Benny Napoleon and write in candidate Mike Duggan? That's what the polls would suggest. I mean, the polling, the latest polling out uh, shows it about dead even between the two of them. It's where it's been. Uh, the question is will that translate to people actually going into the polling booth and remembering how to vote for Mike Duggan? I think if this were, if his name were on the ballot, uh, it would be no question. Those two would be. Uh, the two who would get on the November ballot, but it's still a big question mark. Will people remember how to do it? Has he done enough to educate the public? Uh, well, no, you, you can never do enough. Uh, mm -hmm. There's going to be people who screw it up, who spell his name wrong or forget to, to, to do it quite the right way. The and the question will, the circle, you've got to darken the circle uh, next to the right in uh, line too. So it's going to come down to whether the, the board of canvassers and the clerk can work out which votes he gets uh, out of the right ends and which ones he doesn't. It, just like any election though, this, this comes down to turnout. You know, can Mike Duggan turn out the people who were gonna vote for him anyway um, and, and, and make sure they do the right thing? Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I, people keep asking me who you think is gonna win and I keep saying, well, you tell me who's gonna vote and then I can tell you who I well, think is gonna win. One of the things we've gotta take a look at is how well he did with his absentee uh, yeah. ballot voters because that's a little different I mean you yes. you can um you help can coach if them, you will yeah. I mean you can't well, really help them sitting down at your ballot, house you know and take a little can, time you know yeah. you can make yeah. sure that uh, right. people have a, a little more time you give them an instruction seat what have you and I don't know what the absentee ballot um how large a vote it I is I have well it's a big it's a big chunk of the vote in Detroit all, always because okay. uh, you got so many seniors uh, and they automatically are eligible for Has that. Has anybody pulled um, that? Uh, I saw some information this week that suggested the absentee ballots uh, weighted much more heavily toward Mike Duggan than I would have suspected. Now no one would show me the actual poll, no one would tell me what the methodology was, but it was a, it was a significant sample, and he had a he had a vast majority of the votes, mm -hmm. uh, way more than Benny Napoleon. So, uh, what, if that holds and and turns out to be the way it happened well, on election and day, it could be huge. They're talking about turnout about twelve to fifteen percent, yeah. which is so that's small. Yeah. And you would think that would benefit um, Mike Duggan if he's got a good ground game and is getting his people out. What uh, the other thing that helps him out is the field behind those two is extraordinarily weak. I'm not sure yeah. any of them can clear the 10% mark. Do you? No, I think I think if you had stronger other candidates, he'd be in more trouble, Like uh, just like Nolan said. But you've got sort of uh, 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 assembly of clowns uh, yeah. but between uh, 
the rest of them, and that's they're not going to they're not going to siphon enough votes from anybody to make much of a difference. And in the polls I saw um, this week, uh, you know, Tom Barrow is was in third place in both of them, and still way way behind. I'm not sure the lunatic fringe is large enough uh, in terms of the 12, 15 percent turnout to put Tom Barrow on the ballot. So that no. works in Duggan's favor. Yeah, I think. Were you surprised by some of the comments that some of the candidates were making earlier this week during your forum um, that it's still an, an us versus them? Like once they, if they become mayor, it's that that's well, that's a, there's a lot of people in the city who feel that way. I, I, I have always maintained that's not the majority, and I think that uh, that we have a lot of evidence that that's not the majority. If you go back four years. When we had this election before, we had four elections in, in one year because of all the craziness. Um, uh, look at who won those elections. Dave okay. Bing won four times, first against Ken Cockrell, who was a very good candidate, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then against Tom Barrow. I, I, I think if you, can, if you can sort of project that forward to now and assume that the electorate hasn't changed that much, uh, the majority of the city doesn't believe that stuff, but you do have a political class in Detroit that feeds it uh, but, and feeds but why, off of it. If it's true, and, and I believe you're right, I think the majority of Detroit doesn't feel that way, but you wouldn't have known that from that You form. would not have known why from that Why do, the, do these folks continue to pander to that, um, that viewpoint, to that well, attitude? I think they believe even the Napoleon, stuff they're saying. Even Napoleon and Duggan, and they didn't believe some of the stuff right. they were saying. They know, and I ran into um, Napoleon at um, lunch the next day after that, he knows you know, that you can't govern the way he was talking. So why do they have to campaign that So way? do you think it really does break down to what you wrote in your column this week, that there's an old Detroit, new Detroit? I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would, uh, see, I don't think I would you can't divide put it, in that, it easy, that way. Yeah. Terms. I mean, I think there are a significant number of people in Detroit who realize that we have been making poor decisions for a, a long time and are ready to do something different. Now, uh, Who's speaking to how, them in this campaign? How, disappoint, how disappointed are those people about Dave Bing? I think that's one of the problems, right? Dave Bing uh, promised a lot of things that he couldn't deliver on, and so some of those voters are maybe now saying, mm, this didn't work. Uh, I think Mike Duggan is trying to speak to those voters. He's trying to say, he I am different. Tuesday night, he didn't Tuesday night. And, and I that think, was a disappointment. And I think there's a legitimate question about how different Mike Duggan truly is. Mike Duggan is in some ways a throwback as well to... Uh, old Wayne County politics, right. and uh, you know, I, I'm not sure who that candidate is in this in this race. He wasn't well, on that stage Tuesday night. Well, he night. wasn't on the stage Tuesday night. Well, that but maybe what we'll was start stressing to us because leadership is going to be political leadership has to get better in the city. It has to improve. Everybody is looking at bankruptcy and saying, "Oh, this is an opportunity for a new start, a new day in, in Detroit." We'll be better off coming out of it. We'll only be better off coming out of it if we pick better leaders. And the, these, there wasn't anyone on that stage Tuesday night who convinced me that no. they could take Detroit in a new no. direction after but bankruptcy. I, but I, I do want to say that, that, that and to be fair, there are some people on that stage who were not uh, completely disappointing. There are some people on that stage who are good people with good heads on their shoulders. They may not be ready to be mayor, mm -hmm. uh, but, but someone like Fred Durhall, uh, I've always been a big fan of Fred Durhall's. Uh, he's not crazy. He's not uh, incompetent. No. Uh, uh, Lisa Howes. Lisa Howes was a good state rep. She's been uh, an she agitator in this Tuesday. race. She's done badly in this and, race. And when she came but before us on the editorial board, yeah. extraordinarily disappointing yes, with her answers. Yes, and she's ours not too. only not ready to be mayor. I'm not sure she's ready, <laughs> you know, to be anything. But I think. I think well, that's I, but let's talk time. about this new generation, though. Yeah. Are some of those leaders? Are we perhaps seeing them now in the city council race? Because that's what I want to shift to in talking about. We finally have the districts and people are going to be voting at that for the first time. Are we starting to see some different leadership emerge there? And it's will you see that on city council then? If they get elected, I think yeah. there are some positive city council candidates out there. I mean, and, and you know, the difference perhaps with some of them is they're not necessarily coming out of the union movement yeah. and, and they're not um, sort that of makes beholden to the preachers. And, you know, if they can get elected, they can do well. But let's see if they can get elected. Did you find it easier in your endorsement process to pick those people for city council? I, I did not have, uh, I'll say this, there was no district where I didn't feel like there was a qualified candidate for us to back. Uh, and in most districts, we found several who we, we had to sort of choose among, which is a good thing. Um, uh, I, I think ultimately what, what we're wondering is whether this will be an election like four years ago, which was a change election in Detroit, no question, mayor and council all going in a different direction, mm -hmm. or whether it will be like last year in the state house races in Detroit where we saw a real move backwards, uh, a retrograde kind of delegation elected 
that 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 is in conflict with that with that change movement. And I, I guess we, you know it's really going to depend on who turns out on Tuesday as to which direction we go. And it you know it really is possible that we get a worse council than we had this this time. I mean, there's no guarantee we're going to improve uh, ourselves. All right, what about the results on Tuesday night? How long are we going to have to Don't wait for that? Don't stay up. <laughs> Don't stay up. Is it one of those things that's like, well, give me a call tomorrow uh, and find well, out how long is that lucky. process going to take it could take for a mayor? Week. I mean, yeah. it could take a week. If there's a lot of absentee ballots, every single one of them has to be counted and looked at individually. They can't be, um, I mean, once they go through the scanner, they, the write ins will be sorted out and you know they've got to be one by one. Yeah, and, and Wayne don't, County Board and of Canvassers and don't count out no Detroit Election Commission, right? Uh, it mm. would be Wayne County Board of Canvassers who go through the go through the thing. Go through okay. the do, I think who we'll go through the, the ballots and, and figure out who gets what votes. But, but also don't count challenged. out don't count out legal right. action. There will be challenges uh, to this this question of this Mike Duggan versus this Mike Dujan or however you say his name. We didn't even get a chance to, that's to uh, gonna be, discuss that. I mean, Do you think that's going to be a huge factor? I think, I think if I'm that other candidate, I try to claim as many of the ballots that say Mike Duggan as possible because uh, how do you know that those people weren't trying to vote for me and misspelled well, the name. Well, he won't, he won't do it. Whoever put him up well, to this will do it. I think that's that, right. And it'll be interesting to see who mounts the challenges based on, yeah. on that. But this, I mean, they'll be lucky if we can get a ballot printed in time for November, because I don't, I don't think this is going to be settled anytime soon. Yeah, I think it's scary, too, also, that you've got people that have got to try to measure what people's intent were when they were writing that's down those names, hard. and that's going to be yeah. very, very difficult. All right, so... Uh, it won't be a late night on Tuesday. It might be a late couple of days, so we'll go see. Go to bed. You Wait know what? If see. you want more information on the candidates running in the primary, go to our website, myweek.org. We have information and interviews with all of the candidates through Detroit Public TV's My Vote Initiative, so you can make an informed decision on Tuesday. All right, now to a quick check on Detroit's bankruptcy. It seems the judge wants things to move as quickly as EM Kevin Orr does, and an interesting battle shaping up as Attorney General Bill Schuette sides with retirees to protect their pensions under the state constitution. What are we looking at here? This is very interesting. On which one? On the Schuette thing? On the Schuette. Well, I mean, he's taken a position. I think it's the right position that his job is to defend the Constitution. This is in the state Constitution. He can't go out there and say, well, I'm going to go to court and defend the Constitution on, on the gay marriage ban, the um, affirmative action ban, but not on this. I mean, he's got to be consistent. And I think um, that's what he's doing here. I'm not sure he's going to prevail. I do believe that federal bankruptcy law will end up trumping the state Constitution, but he does have to mount a defense of it. And if it ends up trumping the state Constitution, though, um, there's a, a, an editorial in the free press today talking about how that it still needs to protect it for the people. Yeah. The well, it, it's got to mean something that the state of Michigan, that the people of the state of Michigan decided to, to, to carve out a very special protection for pensions in the Constitution. I mean, our Constitution protects contracts like most uh, constitutions do, but then goes and says these contracts deserve even more protection uh, on their own than that. Uh, that that has to mean something, and and I, I happen to believe that in the bankruptcy court, you know, bankruptcy is a uniform code. Every state has to, to abide by the same rules. Pensioners are unsecured creditors under that under that code. There's just no way that you can change that. Uh, but that does not absolve the state from the obligation of giving meaning to that constitutional uh, provision, and that may mean the state coming in and, and uh, meeting the meeting I the unfunded what, with what money? Gonna happen. With I, what money? Well, I don't, I don't know where you get it, but yeah, I they, think... There's no money to get, and it's, the state's not going to bail out these pension funds. The state may end up taking over, and they should take it over. Well, and, but and, uh, and, if you do that, then it's you're... it's mismanaged, it's been, you know, drained... But then you still got to make up the unfunded part of it. I think what they're going to end up doing is, is preserving the pensions and taking the health care, because the health care is not protected by... Yeah, well, no one's arguing about that. And, well, yeah. it's still a big hit for these retirees. Sure. If your if your fifteen two thousand dollar a month pension well, is right. intact, but you will suddenly have to go in and get a thousand dollars for sure. a health care policy, sure. you're no better off. So I think that's probably how it's going to play out. And ho and Kevin Orr is hoping perhaps he can give them a small monthly stipend to help um, 
pay their uh, premiums and hopefully Obamacare will kick in and, and cover them. But I think the, the retirees, unfortunately, are going to lose something in this process. Are you still looking for some kind of leadership from our, our lawmakers in Washington, from Michigan? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, think of it this way. Because uh, they're still talking about bailout for uh, Detroit, and, and it's becoming a, a pretty not. big political hot potato, at least for Republicans in Washington yeah. who say, I don't want this Right, to and where's our all. delegation? Uh, uh, <laughs> think of it this way. If New York were in this situation, do you think Charlie Rangel and Chuck Schumer would be sitting on the sidelines not saying anything? They'd be on TV every day talking about the need to come help. Uh, John Conyers, Gary Peters, Debbie Stabenow, Carl Levin, all the rest of, whom, of them, all of them take a lot of union Gary money. P <laughs> Gary Peters and John Conyers held rallies against the, the, the emergency sure. manager, held that rallies against um, the state takeover. And you know, when you asked them, well, what's your idea? Nobody, they didn't have any ideas. And now they've gone away. Yeah. They, I mean, they fought this and then they disappeared. And then they've disappeared. I mean, we need, an, uh, Detroit needs an advocate at the national level for this entire process. And, and our elected officials in Washington are the likely candidates. It's a little frustrating, again, would, would, would Chuck Schumer and uh, Charlie Rangel be sitting on the sidelines? Would, uh, you know, if it were California, would you not see uh, the state, the senators and, and reps from that state? Would. They, they would be all over. And this is a everybody. very um, influential delegation. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, any other um, surprises that we need to look for in the next, uh, in the next week or so, just kind of keeping track of how fast this is moving along? In the bankruptcy? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we're gonna, you know, you saw Kevin Orr this week cut, um, cut the pay of firefighters and, and, and police by 10%, I think he's going to keep moving uh, at a rapid pace, uh, both with the reorganization of the city and with the bankruptcy. Yeah, I think, I think what we saw from Judge Rhodes this week in this, the docketing for this case was the kind of judge he is. This is not somebody yeah. who's going to entertain endless uh, efforts to sort of intervene in the case or take us off uh, into side issues that, that are down a rat hole. He wants mm -hmm. this adjudicated fairly, uh, but, but fairly quickly, too. So uh, this is going to move much faster than some of the other municipal bankruptcies that we've seen yeah. around the country. All right, moving along here. A new poll out this week shows Governor Snyder is slowly regaining support after his approval plummeted to 38 percent after the right to work legislation. According to a Lambert Edwards and Associates poll this month, he's back up to 44 percent approval that uh, a lot of people are approving of the direction that Detroit is in. Well, I don't know if they're approving direction of the, what Detroit is in. I think people appreciate leadership. And this is a state that didn't see much in the way of dynamic leadership for a long time. You may not like what he does, but he is willing to make a decision. He is willing to put his um, capital behind getting things done. He's not going to sit still. And I think people, people appreciate decisive leadership. Leadership in the eye of the beholder? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't have any question uh, w uh, with the governor's leadership. I think he has led. He's done what he said he wanted to do. He's also done some other things he said he wouldn't do, and that's that's the the, the bone of contention that I have with him, and that a lot of the independents in the state who who voted for him will have. I mean, that's really the key here, right? Uh, if he can attract independent voters again uh, in the in the numbers that he did four years ago, he'll win. And, he doesn't and that's even what attract it, him in that numbers. I mean, and that's what this poll showed, that if they put him up against Mark Schauer, that he does still get a lot of the He gets the independent votes, I mean, and that's what matters. And business leaders out with a, uh, a survey this week um, predicting that uh, Michigan recovery will outpace the national recovery over the next 18 months in a strongly recovering economy, even a recovering state economy, an incumbent governor is and, not uh, going to lose. He, he, he probably he probably won't lose, mostly because uh, Mark Schauer is not going to be the candidate no. who could Look beat him. Mark He's Schauer vulnerable. was doing this week while <laughs> the governor was in the national spotlight, you know, managing this, helping manage this process of saving Detroit. Mark Schauer's out there whining about uh, Kevin Orr putting um, calamari on his expense account, which, by the way, he paid Turns for himself. Turns out he's paying for it. He pays for it, for it himself. So he, made it, he made it really look petty. Well, the governor it doesn't have a lot of Republican support when it comes to Medicaid expansion, and that debate has been raging again in Lansing this week. And so now we have um, some different bills coming out of the Senate committee. Um, what, how have they differed from what the House passed? And is there going to be some kind of decision here? I think they're going to start talking about it at the end of August, but can we see something in early fall when it comes to Medicaid expansion? Oh, I predict you will. I mean, you've got three bills now. It's highly unusual to have to move three bills out of committee that are competing.
but I think the, the strategy there is they'll be able to pick and choose from each bill, put it together, and come up with a compromise if, you know, it's still relevant. The way Obamacare is falling apart, I'm not sure it's possible for the state to put together a, a relevant bill. Well, okay, you just said Obamacare is falling apart. <laughs> All right, so you just ah, totally just change, change the topic of yeah, conversation. We already got, we already got 14 million new people with insurance. It's relevant in the legislature because they're looking for some guidance on what this thing's going to look like, and they keep postponing the implementation, yeah. the rulemaking. It's tough for the states to put together a plan that they are sure will comply. It's tough for the states, but other states have done this. Yes. See, it's with actual leadership on this issue, have figured it out. Uh, and, we can't blame the governor on this. The governor is the one that's no, saying absolutely. we want to vote on this. The governor we, this is the, in the done. right place. It's the legislature that, that, that's that been the, the stumbling block here. And, and all of these imagined issues, uh, some of which deserve an answer, uh, and I think Maybe the governor could have been more forthright about giving those answers, giving them publicly to, to put pressure on, on the legislature. But, but this is all about the people who just don't support the law. This is the same thing we saw with implementation of Social Security oh, 60 years ago. The it's absolutely same the same you thing. You have now the curious situation changed of like both business and labor standing well, up no and question. saying, this thing is going to kill jobs. This thing's not going to work. With that kind of uh, united voices rising against this, and remember, you will have um, to the overwhelming majority of the population doesn't support it either. You're going to see real changes to this. Social Security you was changed. Social, Secur Social Security was changed more than a half dozen times uh, by the Congress in the first, I don't know what it was, 18, 20 some months of, of its implementation. The point is, when you were doing something this large on this large a scale and this kind of social shift, which this this legislation marked, done so it has not. It doesn't and, happen overnight, and, and you're going to have to go point, back. And the legislature just crafting law when they don't know what the ground's going to look like. Well, when it's implemented. you know, other states haven't had this problem, so it's not it's well, not as if Michigan is is that anomalous. Doesn't state, that doesn't mean it's going to work, and I don't think you can fault the legislature for being cautious. The issue with this is thing. the issue it's is that it's the potential to bust our budget if it's not done. The issue right. is that in, Republican in lawmakers Re Republican lawmakers don't want it to work. And that's been the, 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 the opposition the whole time. They want to see it fail so they true. can say it didn't work. It's Let's not true. do but something you'd also have, you'd also And they have, have no other you'd alternative. You'd have 400,000 extra people who are covered under insurance, and mm -hmm. they would be mostly in the southeast Michigan 400, area, 400,000 people. 400,000 people. I mean, this is the thing that gets lost. These guys are up there with their insurance that we pay for talking about why they shouldn't, we shouldn't insure other people who don't have insurance. I mean, the, the gall of this is one of the things that, that is really, really testing. But your, problem is, your problem is the structure, correct? My, well, my problem is the uncertainty. Are we going to get stuck with this bill? And in five years, are we going to have to make choices? Do we fund our schools? Do we fund our universities? Or do we raise or taxes do we to pay for this? all of it? Uh, there's no room in Michigan to raise taxes why not? and not stay competitive. We've been down that road, <laughs> and we saw what Actually, happened to our economy. when did we raise taxes? We raised taxes during the Granholm years. We absolutely and, uh, did. At the end, no, you know, we didn't. there's we a, it there's a, two thousand. She also implemented all of the all of the Engler tax cuts, which other states didn't do then, early in the then, in the decade. And then pushed taxes and fees up across the board. But you, if this we, is our such taxes a great, are down twenty five percent. I mean, one of the things, one of from the, things, the end of the Engler, not uh, when you count in all of the additional they taxes. Sure, and they fees. are. When you when you look at you want to look at this thing today you, in Washington, you've got a debate going on whether Congress and their aides and their staffers are going to participate in Obamacare, and they they're pitching a fit about having to participate. If it's that great a, a program, why do the people who because they have they have wrote it Cadillac uh, uh, health care well, so that, that, that folks we, if they can if they're, they're going to get employees. written out, why should others? I don't think others? they should. I don't think I they mean, should you be had, written out. You had all, the major unions standing up and saying this thing is going to hurt job job creation in America. It needs to be fixed. That's well, because I mean, everybody is is. Uh, now beholden to this idea that tax policy is what drives job creation, which is a complete falsity. Complete falsity. And this well, is going to continue. that's absolutely ridiculous. Steve. It's not ridiculous. All right, tell them why it's ridiculous in the well, 30 seconds that we have left. Because any time you've dropped capital gains taxes, any time you've dropped the corporate income tax, you've had economic growth in this country. Jim Blanchard, Those Jim Blanchard, are Jim Blanchard, you can look up. Jim Blanchard raised taxes in his first term and grew more jobs in his first term than Rick Snyder is on pace to grow now. So, so what, what does that say? Well. Steve, any time we've cut the, no, no, the no, taxes no. on business, that's, that's a specific example. Stuff, and you can cite, the, um, you know, Maybe it's cut that, taxes, grew the economy. Right. Maybe it's that 
tax policy has little to do with job growth. It absolutely has everything to do with job growth. All right, we're going to solve this. If the government this, takes the money, you not don't the, have money to It's not the main jobs. lever. It's not the main lever and on And all job I said creation. was Medicaid expansion, right? <laughs> now we're talking and about tax policy. all I said is Medicaid policy. expansion. All right, just uh, wrapping up the show, just a little bit of uh, political news. Um, Congressman Dave Camp thinking about running for mm -hmm. Carl Levin's seat. What does that do to Terry Lynn Land? Well, it puts her out of the race. If he gets in, it gets her out of the race. I want to know why? what those conversations well, look like. I want to know what those conversations look like in the GOP. Like, who makes that phone call? And she I'm says, wait sure, a minute. I'm not sure I, I agree I with that. Terry Lynn Land has won statewide mm -hmm. office. Uh, Dave Camp, great, uh, great uh, member of Congress. I mean, I, I'm not knocking him, but is not that well known outside of his district. Dave Camp has $3 million in his um, campaign coffers to start. She will not be able to raise a dime. And I like Terry and, and thought she would be a good candidate against Peters. But if Camp gets in, she's not going to be able to raise the money to stay in this race. And that's got to be disappointing for her because she came out early. I don't well, think that's... But she came out early and, you know, she was willing to put herself in. But if, if Camp gets in, I mean, she's already having trouble raising, raising money. Raising money. And if Camp gets in, the money goes away. I still think there's an interesting conversation of him leaving a powerful position in Congress right now. In the well, remember, his, his chairmanship's term limited, so mm -hmm. he won't be in that powerful position for the next um, session of Congress. So it's a little less he's giving up than perhaps if he ran uh, another time. All right. Well, that is going to have to do it. Thanks, guys. I so appreciate it. We'll see you next <laughs> week, and that'll do it for my week. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter, so you can keep up with us at the latest political and news analysis, even when you're not watching Detroit Public TV. We'll see you next week. Take care.